Thank you, Terrence, and thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm Dr. Chevron, I'm an assistant professor of communication studies at MTSU, and uh, the topic of my talk today is going to be on queer activism in the late 80s and early 1990s and how crucial this was for um, LGBTQ visibility. The last time I saw him, I was 11 years old. It was late in the afternoon, and he's lying on the couch in the living room, his sandy long hair blown back in the place where the sutures had been. The staples had pierced his scalp, raised rivets that stretched from the nape of his neck diagonally towards his ear. He'd been in the hospital in late fall for surgery to drain excess fluids from his brain. Now the flowers were starting to bloom. After I left that day, I never saw him again. I lost my father to AIDS in 1992, four years before the development of retrovirals, the medicine that could have saved his life. So um, the topic of queer activism in the late 80s and early 90s is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, and the development of the medicine that does treat people with AIDS today is directly connected to and emerged from the fight against AIDS by queer activists. So um, in my talk today, I'm going to be speaking with you a little bit about uh, publics and counterpublics, just to start off with, and then we'll focus specifically on queer counterpublic activism and uh, the influence that it has had on our contemporary lives. So this is a model of the public sphere uh, from Jürgen Habermas. And uh, the public sphere is kind of this arena where the people have influence on the state. So the idea of the public sphere is that um, this is part of democracy. This is where people, through reason deliberation, have an impact on the decisions made by the state. So when you come together in town hall meetings or when you go out and vote, you're participating in the public sphere. Um, and people who were writing about the public sphere uh, were kind of concerned about what impact mass media might have on the public sphere, on democracy, on deliberation, with the idea being that state control um, was going to occur through the dominant media, that the state through media would control the people. Um, a lot of people have said, however, that this model is insufficient. And rather than one public sphere, what we actually have are um, a variety of counterparts. So these are smaller spheres in which people come together and make decisions. And within those spheres, which we could think of as communities, whatever communities or groups you may be involved in, those communities then impact the public. And counterpublics, um, they might be big, they might be small, some of them might overlap, some of them might influence the mainstream or the dominant public more, some of them may be further removed. So for example, I'm a member of multiple publics, some of which overlap with one another and some of which don't. Um, as a bisexual woman, I'm part of a queer public. As a MTSU professor, I'm part of the university public. As a feminist, I'm part of the feminist public and some of these uh, interactions overlap more than others. So in terms of what impact can I have on the state, on democracy, on the public sphere, um, it can occur through many of these different arenas. So queer counterpublic activism then, what a counterpublic is, is a marginalized kind of group that challenges the dominant public. And uh, queer counterpublic activism, I'm going to focus today on two uh, organizations in particular. And the first of these is ACT UP, 
or the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. This is an advocacy group that was formed in 1987, and um, their primary focus was on uh, gaining access for AIDS drugs. And the need for ACT UP is very apparent when you consider the epidemic that has taken so much out of the gay and queer community. So um, ACT UP, they came together in 1987, about 300 people came together um, with the slogan, the initial slogan, United in Anger. And uh, the public perception of AIDS at this time was as a gay plague. And so the dominant public notion was that AIDS is gay people getting what they deserve. So ACT UP uh, came to challenge this public notion. And I've got a few clips that I'd like to show you today. These are from a... Um, movie called United in Anger. And the first of these uh, have to do with the public perception of AIDS at this time. <clears throat> it was in the Japanese. How deeply are Americans worried about AIDS? Los Angeles Times poll found that 50% of Americans favor quarantine for AIDS victims. 48% said they should be issued special identification. 15% said AIDS victims should be tattooed. We were very scared of the fifth, the making the fifth in 54 days in turn. Yes. And I think that we came close to that this country. I So we hear in that media clip then that over 50% of the American public wanted to quarantine people with AIDS. And so in the face um, of this sort of public oppression, ACT UP used a variety of tactics to bring uh, queer visibility to the public. And they engaged in poster campaigns, they engaged in nonviolent protests, and specifically what they called die-ins. <clears throat> and they also um, went to agencies like the FDA with targeted demands for drugs. So I want to show you a few of their posters. And this first poster speaks directly to the issue that you just heard about in that media clip. This um, is a very well-known poster from ACT UP. And their slogan, Silence Equals Death, and their use of the pink triangle are both um, very symbolically important. Does anybody know where the pink triangle comes from? Yeah, in the background. Uh, the pink triangle was a marker for specifically gay men during the Holocaust and uh, the fire. Yeah, absolutely. So the pink triangle, um, gay people had to wear it much as uh, Jewish people had to wear a marker. Um, and so they were considered, as Terrence said in her introduction, they were considered a less than subhuman group. And so the reclamation of that pink triangle um, is an important strategy and tactic of queer activism, the re-signifying of an oppressive symbol. So they took the pink triangle and they said, we're not going to be oppressed by this. And instead, um, they took this as a symbol of gay pride and liberation. And so the Silence Equals Death Project, uh, these posters were plastered around New York City, and uh, in the point being to draw parallels between the Nazi period and the AIDS crisis, that to not speak was to directly um, cause the death of people. Here are a few other posters. And this is an image of uh, one of their die-ins. 
Now, one of their most famous die-ins actually took place in a Catholic church when the Archbishop, I believe um, O'Connor at the time, was visiting, and his uh, agenda was very much against condoms, and they were saying, hey, your beliefs, this agenda, not your religion, but this policy is killing people. And so during a mass, they went and lied down on the floor in the church um, as if they were dead until the police had to come and carry them out. And so they would engage in these kinds of die-ins. Um, so another, one of the things that these die-ins would do and this public activism from ACT UP would do is their point was that this isn't a matter of politics. This isn't do you accept LGBTQ people and think that they have the same rights or whatever. This isn't a um, ideological discussion. This is a real life or death scenario. And so with their strategy of targeted demands, they would also do actions. Um, this is an action at the FDA headquarters. And um, this was one of their primary focuses, was to release the drugs. That was a slogan, and that's what they would shout, release the drugs. And um, basically, they were correct in identifying that US government homophobia was preventing adequate research and access for members of a queer public to these drugs. So uh, basically, as one activist put it, lives depended on them. This was very real. And by making it very uncomfortable through these kinds of protests, by making it uncomfortable for the powers that be, whether that's the church, the state, um, the drug companies, by making it uncomfortable, you could affect very quick change. Uh, I wanted to show you another clip that I think is just kind of fun to show the, the extremes that this group went to. So this is also from the movie. And this is when they actually stormed a mainstream news organization. So you'll see the news broadcast start, and then you'll hear their voices come in in the background. CBS News with Dan Rather. Um, but 
he, uh, he did acquire AIDS through same-sex um, interactions, but this was closeted, or I mean, maybe he was bisexual. It was not a topic that was uh, available for discussion. And likewise, his presumably gay male friends who were single men or one man who was living with another man for his entire life, they were all in the closet too. And that was um, what life looked like for a lot of queer individuals at that time. The idea being that your private life is your private life. You don't bring it out into the public. That is not where it belongs. And that's how people were able to pass or you know, um, be active in the public sphere as queer individuals. Well, queer nation, especially with the impact of the AIDS crisis and all of these deaths, said, no, we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to stay silent. It's too important. So queer nation, uh, their tactics were very much intended to bring queer visibility in your face. So if you go to a protest today, you might hear somebody shout, we're here, we're queer, get used to it. That's where this comes from. And so um, confrontational slogans were one of their hallmarks, militant protests, and rather than die-ins, queer nation engaged in kiss-ins. So their inaugural protest, which I want to just briefly describe to you, was at Flutie's Bar. April 3rd, 1990, in New York. And Flutie's Bar, importantly, was not a gay bar. Because that's where they were supposed to be, of course, over at the gay bar, in their own space. And they came to Flutie's Bar, a bunch of activists, for a direct action where they basically started kissing one another in Flutie's Bar. And people were like, no, you don't belong here. Like, and their point was that this is not a bar, or what you call a bar, is a straight bar. So their point was to mark the exclusion um, of gay people from public space and to highlight the unspoken belief that public space was heterosexual space. So um, these kinds of militant protests uh, this emphasis on confrontational visibility, it quite it differed very much from mainstream gay and lesbian activism at that time, which took more of an assimilationist route, which took the route, we're just like you. And um, Queer Nation said, we're queer, we don't have to be just like you, but we're here. So controversial language um, was also a hallmark. I've kept this mostly PG, not entirely, but I've kept it a little bit PG because I anticipated there might be some young people here. There will be one image shared here that is not uh, that PG. So promote queer visibility. This is one of their images. On this one, we have um, different posters uh, with slogans like, I like on the bottom, we have homophobia is a social disease. Warning, homophobia can be dangerous to your health. And here we see queer nation in your face. Uh, this is, might be the next one. It's not PG. Oh, no, it's the one after this. Promote homosexuality. <laughs> and this next one, I just wanted to give you a little tiny taste. We won't linger on it, but... <laughs> and now the point of my showing that last image is much like reappropriating the word queer or reappropriating the pink triangle. They were trying to call attention to the insulting degradation of queer people and say, yeah, sure, I am a uh, F. I, I am the F. So we see here, um, this is a protest also in the early 90s, and they took a very confrontational, aggressive kind of style in their protests. The idea being that they were going to bash back. So if gay bashing uh, was going to carry on, they would bash back against the bashers.
right, so, oh, here we go, a few more images. These are images of the kids in. And in these protests, there was kind of a mixture of this kind of militant, confrontational visibility, but also a kind of joyous uh, embrace of life. A camp style, if you've heard um, people talk about camp as a kind of gay theatricality. So um, this was very much about the visibility uh, of queer people. So ACT UP and Queer Nation uh, were both very influential in the ways that we do protests today. They were influential in bringing drugs needed drugs to the public so that now, today, with retrovirals, people with AIDS can live um, a full lifespan. Medicine for AIDS is now so good that it can reduce it to an undetectable level in your blood, which it can't even be transmitted. And the fact that a lot of people still don't actually know that uh, signifies that the job is not done. There is still a lot of invisibility and stigma. So uh, ACT UP, they brought these drugs to the public. Queer activism redrew the blueprint for activism in a media age. So these kinds of confrontational tactics, the use of uh, what in rhetorical scholarship we call image events, these confrontational shocking images that use the body to bring visibility. And uh, we've got a little slide mishap here. But what it should say at the bottom here is queer publicity. So the fact that LGBTQ um, people can now engage in public spheres um, is directly uh, resulting from a lot of the 80s and 90s queer activism. And the reshaping of what's considered public and what's considered private. And finally, um, so through this, the changing social attitudes towards gay men and women in the 1990s and today then came from a lot of this activism, even though as ACT UP, um, as one ACT UP put, activist put it, their purpose was not to be liked. Their purpose was to save lives. And so um, in summary then, we've talked a little bit about publics and counterpublics and specifically about the queer counterpublic activism of these two groups and then the ways that that has influenced our life today. So uh, I appreciate your having me out today uh, for this talk and I think um, that's about the time that I have allotted. So I'm Roberta Sheffra again from MTSU. And if you like what you heard today, if any of you, I thought there might be some high school students here, uh, check out our communication studies program.